Hey, what's going on, guys? Tanmay for Simple Snippets, and welcome back to another video tutorial under operating systems. And today we're going to be taking a look at multi-level feedback queue scheduling algorithm, which is a CPU scheduling algorithm. And in the previous video of this entire CPU scheduling algorithm playlist, we saw multi-level queue scheduling. So in multi-level scheduling, there are two different types. That is, there is multi-level queue scheduling and multi-level feedback queue scheduling. Okay, so this is sort of like the second type of multi-level queue scheduling. So if you have missed that previous video, you can check it out in this playlist, and I'll drop the link. And you can also see a card on the top right corner which points to that video. Anyway, starting off with today's topic, in multi-level feedback queue scheduling, we have multiple levels. That is, we have multiple different ready queues. But the difference here is there is a mechanism of feedback which happens in this algorithm. So let me just quickly give you a recap about the normal multi-queue scheduling algorithm. So in normal multi-queue scheduling algorithm, processes are permanently assigned to a queue on entry to the system. So there is no moving of processes between different queues. So what exactly this point says is in the previous video, that is in simple multi-level queue scheduling, we saw that if a process is a system process, it is assigned to queue number one. And if it is a batch process, it is assigned to some other queue. That is, let's say it is assigned to queue number two. So once it is assigned to those respective queues, so they do not switch between the different queues depending upon the scheduling needs or depending upon how the processing is happening. So this makes it very inflexible. And this is a major disadvantage because this causes starvation. So by starvation, I mean, so let's say there are very few batch processes. That is, let's say there are two, three batch processes. However, there are n number of system processes. That is, let's say there are hundred system processes. So according to multi-level queue scheduling, all the hundred processes will be executed first by the CPU. And only then these two, three batch processes will be taken care of by the CPU because queue number one, which is assigned for system processes has higher priority over queue number two. So that's why the two, three processes, which were there in the batch processing queue are starved and they have to wait a lot of time, right? So this is a major drawback in the basic multi-level queue scheduling. So this is where this feedback mechanism comes into picture. And the idea is to separate processes within different CPU characteristics. And if a process uses too much CPU time, it will be moved to a lower priority queue. Similarly, if a process that waits too long in a lower priority queue may be moved to a higher priority queue and this form of aging prevents starvation, right? So this is where there is a little bit of flexibility, which means that different processes can be moved in different queues. So in the diagram, you can see that there are three different queues. So this is one, this is two, and this is three. However, you can see this arrow wherein a feedback mechanism is provided and processes are moved between different ready queues, depending upon whether they are waiting too long or whether they are waiting for a very small amount of time. So basically what happens is multi-level feedback queue scheduling keeps analyzing the behavior of the processes and according to which it changes its priority. So this is a smart system and in general, a multi-level feedback queue scheduler is defined by the following parameters. So the number of queues, so how many number of queues are there, the scheduling algorithm for each queue. Now each queue can have different algorithms. So queue number one can have round robin, queue number two can have FCFS, queue number three can have SGF and so on and so forth. And then there are certain other criteria like the method used to determine when to upgrade a process to a higher priority. Similarly, the method used to determine when to demote a process to a lower priority and the method used to determine which queue a process will enter when the process needs service. Okay. So all these parameters are complex parameters on which CPU scheduling algorithm works, especially the multi-level feedback queue scheduling. And this was a little bit of theory, but now let's actually see a practical example that is a numerical. And after solving that numerical, you will be very clear about how this entire multi-level feedback queue scheduling works. Okay, so as you can see on the screen, we have a numerical wherein we have four different processes P1, P2, P3 and P4. Let's say the burst time or the time is in milliseconds in this case. So we have P1 which is 53 milliseconds, P2 17 and so on and so forth. Now for simplicity purpose, let's assume that all of their arrival times is at 0th millisecond. And now we have to calculate completion time, turnaround time and waiting time for all these processes. And what is given is we have three different queues, queue number one, queue number two and queue number three, out of which queue number one and queue number two uses round robin. But queue number one has a quantum of 17 and queue number two has a quantum of 25. 
I hope you already know what is round robin algorithm and FCFS. If not, you can check out this playlist wherein we've discussed all the other CPU scheduling algorithms. So you can check each of these individual algorithms. So we have three different queues. You can see in the solution also we have queue number one, queue number two and queue number three. So now let's start off with actual numerical and let's see how this works. So starting off, since the arrival time of P1, P2, P3 and P4 is zero, all of these processes will be first added to the first queue that is queue number one. Okay. So this is the entry point. So let me just add all these processes over here. So I'm going to say P1. So all of them are pushed in like this. So P1 is to the rightmost end. Then we have P2. Then we have P3. And lastly, we have P4. Okay. So this is how the processes are being pushed into the ready queue. So this is queue number one. It is the first ready queue. Now the CPU is going to pick one process, which is at the rearmost end. That is where the queue ends, you can say. So it's going to pick P1 and it is going to add it to the process queue. That is, it is going to start processing it. So we know queue number one is using round robin and the quantum is seven. So let me just first add P1 over here, starting at zeroth millisecond. P1 is going to be executed for 17 milliseconds, right? So that's the quantum. We know that the burst time is 53. So starting from zero to 17, CPU is going to execute P1. Okay. So 53 minus 17 is 36, which means that P1 would be left with 36 milliseconds of processing time still. So after 17 seconds, CPU is going to still switch between the processes because the quantum is of 17 for Q number one which means that the CPU has to select a new process. But now the CPU or the scheduling algorithm sees that P1 is still requiring 36 milliseconds more, right? So what this scheduling algorithm is going to do is it's going to promote or you can say demote P1 to Q2. So P1 is going to be removed from Q number one and it is going to be pushed in Q number two. So I'm going to write P1 over here. Okay. Because P1 is still requiring 36 milliseconds. So the algorithm says that, okay, this P1 is taking too much of time. Let's actually add it to Q number two because Q number two has a larger quantum of 25. So maybe in that queue, it will get over. Okay. So in maybe in that queue, if the CPU takes in the process, it will try to finish it off. So now again, the CPU checks in Q number one because Q number one has higher priority than Q number two and Q number two has higher priority than Q number three. So this is how it works. So now CPU sees that, okay, in Q number one, we still have P2, P3 and P4 left. So CPU takes P2 now. So I'm just going to write P2 over here. So from 17 seconds, P2 is going to be starting to execute. So we know that P2's burst time is 17 and the quantum is also 17, which means CPU will completely execute P2. So from 17, we just need to add 17 more. So 17 plus 17 is 34 and P2 is actually done, which means that the process P2 is completely processed by the CPU. Okay. So now the CPU is going to check for P3 because Q1 has still two processes P4 and P3. So it's going to start processing P3 from 34th second. And we know the burst time of P3 is 68 seconds, which means that the first quantum of 17 seconds is not going to be enough, right? So 34 plus 17 is going to be 51 but P3 still requires 51 seconds more because 68 minus 17 is going to give you 51. So I'm going to write 51 over here, which means it still requires 50 and milliseconds to complete process P3. And now the CPU is going to add this P3 to Q number two, because in the first run, it could not complete P3. So CPU or the scheduling algorithm is going to demote this process to Q number two. So I'm just going to write P3 over here. So from here it is removed. And now the CPU takes on P4. So from 51, it's going to start processing P4 for 17 seconds. P4 requires 24 milliseconds. So 24 minus 17 is going to give you seven seconds, which means seven seconds still will be left after processing P4 for 17 seconds. And 51 plus 17 is going to be 68 seconds. So at 68 millisecond, CPU has processed P4 for 17 milliseconds, but it's still not completed because it requires still seven seconds more or seven milliseconds more. So even P4 is now demoted to Q number two. Okay. So now CPU checks Q number two because there is nothing left in Q number one, right? All of the processes which were left out are demoted to Q number two. 
So from 60th millisecond, CPU is going to start scheduling P1 because it came first in the queue number 2. So I'm going to write P1 over here. Now for queue number 2, we have quantum of 25. How many milliseconds left for P1? 36. Right? So from 68, P1 is going to be executed for 25 milliseconds more. So 68 plus 25 is going to give us 93. Okay? And 36 minus 25 is going to give us 11. Which means even after processing P1 for 25 milliseconds, 11 milliseconds are still left out, which means P1 is still not completed. And now CPU is going to say, okay, I'm just going to demote P1 to Q number 3. Okay, so it's removed from Q number 2 and it is demoted to Q number 3 now. So now CPU takes P3. So because P3 is next in line in Q number 2, so I'm going to write P3 over here. P3 requires 51 milliseconds still left. The quantum is 25. So from 93, P3 is going to be executed by the CPU for 25 milliseconds, which is 118. And 51 minus 25 is going to be 26, right? So 26 milliseconds are still left out of P3. So again, CPU is going to demote this P3 to Q number 3 because it could not finish off P3 from this Q in first go. So it's going to say, okay, I'm just going to demote it to Q number 3. And now CPU will start off executing P4 because this is the last process left in Q number 2 after which it will see Q number 3. So I'm just going to add P4 over here. For P4, we know only 7 milliseconds are left. So P4 will be completed in this one single go because the quantum is 25, which is greater than 7. So 118 plus 7 is 125. And now P4 is actually done. Okay. So I'm just going to erase it off. And now CPU is going to move to the last Q that is the Q3, which uses FCFS, which means first come first serve. So it's going to just take a look at the first process that is P1. It's going to add P1 over here. And you know, P P1 requires 11 milliseconds. So since it is FCFS, it will complete P1 till 125 plus 11 milliseconds. Since it is FCFS, it will not stop until the process one is completed. So 125 plus 11 is going to be 136 and then P1 is also done. So P1 is done. So the last process now left is P3, which you can see is 26 milliseconds left out. So the CPU is going to take P3 and since it is in the Q3, it is using FCFS, which means that it will not stop until the entire process is completed, which means entire 26 milliseconds have not passed. So 136 plus 26 will give us 162 and then P3 is going to be completed. So this was the complete GAN chart or the process queue of how the CPU schedules and processes all these different processes in the proper order. And now using this GAN chart that is using this complete process queue, we can calculate completion time, turnaround time and waiting time. So let's do that. So the completion time for process one is when the CPU completed P1. So let's see in the GAN chart when P1 was completed. So the last instance is when it was completed. So you can see 136 millisecond is the last instance of P1. So I'm just going to write 136. For P2, it is going to be 34. You can see this is the last instance in the GAN chart after which you cannot see P2 in the entire process queue. For P3, it is going to be 162. And for P4, you can see that it is 125. So this is the last instance. Moving on to turnaround time. So to calculate turnaround time, we can do that by using the formula completion time minus arrival time. So since for all of the processes, we've assumed arrival time as zero, the turnaround time is going to be 136 minus zero. That is 136. This is going to be 34. This is going to be 162 and this is going to be 125. So it's going to remain as it is because arrival time is zero in all the cases. And lastly, waiting time is going to be given by turnaround time minus burst time. So turnaround time is this value for process one and burst time is 53. So 136 minus 53, which is equal to 83. Then 34 minus 17, which is 17. Then for process three, we have 162 minus 68, which is 94. Lastly, we have 125 minus 24, which is 101. So these were the individual turnaround time, waiting time and completion times. Now we can calculate the average turnaround time and waiting time. So the average turnaround time would be total of all these values divided by four because we have four processes. So 136 plus 34 plus 162 plus 125 
डिवाइड बाय फोर विच इज गोइंग टू बी फोर फिफ्टी सेवन डिवाइड बाय फोर विच इज हंड्रेड एंड फोर्टीन पॉइंट टू फाइव मिली सेकेंड्स ओके सो दिस इज मिली सेकेंड्स सो दिस इज द एवरेज टर्न अराउंड टाइम सो एवरेज टर्न अराउंड टाइम इज गोइंग टू बी हंड्रेड एंड फोर्टीन पॉइंट टू फाइव एंड दिस इज इन मिली सेकेंड्स लेस कैलकुलेट एवरेज वेटिंग टाइम सो एवरेज वेटिंग टाइम इज अगेन गोइंग टू बी टोटल ऑफ ऑल दीज फोर वैल्यूज दैट इज एटी थ्री प्लस सेवनटीन प्लस नाइन्टी फोर प्लस वन जीरो वन डिवाइड बाई फोर बिकॉज वी हैव फोर प्रोसेस दैट्स हाउ एवरेज इज कैलकुलेटेड एंड वी हैव टू नाइन्टी फाइव डिवाइड बाय फोर विच इज गोइंग टू बी सेवेंटी थ्री पॉइंट सेवन फाइव मिली सेकेंड्स सो एवरेज वेटिंग टाइम ऑफ द एंटायर सिस्टम इज गोइंग टू बी सेवेंटी थ्री पॉइंट सेवन फाइव मिली सेकेंड्स सो दीज व द फाइनल आंसर्स एंड ऑल द वैल्यूज दैट नीड्स टू बी कैलकुलेटेड इन अ यूजल शेड्यूलिंग प्रॉब्लम सो दैट्स इट फॉर दिस वीडियो गाइज आई होप यू अंडरस्टूड द एंटायर मल्टी लेवल फीडबैक क्यू शेड्यूलिंग प्रॉब्लम एंड हाउ इट इज डिफरेंट फ्रॉम द बेसिक मल्टी लेवल क्यू शेड्यूलिंग वी ऑल्सो सॉ द थियरी एज वेल एज वी सॉ प्रैक्टिकल न्यूमेरिकल सम सो इफ यू लाइक दिस वीडियो एंड इफ यू हैव अंडरस्टूड दिस कॉन्सेप्ट प्लीज गिव इट अ थम्स अप एंड लेट मी नो इन द कॉमेंट्स दट यू लाइक दिस वीडियो ऑल्सो डू शेयर इट विथ योर फ्रेंड्स एंड इफ यू हैव एंटेड सब्सक्राइब ऑन दिस चैनल मेक श्यूर यू सब्सक्राइब सो दट यू गेट नोटिफाइड वन एवर आई अपलोड अ न्यू वीडियो टूटोरियल एंड फॉर दैट यू कैन टर्न ऑन द नोटिफिकेशन एज वेल So thanks for watching guys I'll see you guys in the next video peace